I'm going to be sharing part one of a message with you today on praying for the Holy Spirit. This is the year of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to be learning some things. I think you're going to catch some things and understand some concepts that you never have before as we enjoy it time together. Take your Bible in your hand, if you would, please. The Scripture tells us that the holy men of God gave these words by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Let's take and stand and declare this together. This is my Bible. It is the incomparable, inerrant, authoritative Word of God. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I have what it says I have. I choose to live as it calls me to live. I'm open and ready to receive from God's living Word. You may be seated. We're going to open up to Luke chapter number 11, and the following is a joke. This is only a joke. This is a test of the emergency pastoral joke system. So there were these two churches. They couldn't get a pastor. There's a big problem today. Not enough pastors to go around. So they thought, why don't we get together, we form one church, and then, you know, we can get a pastor maybe. And so they started going over, well, do you guys believe in this? Yeah, well, of course we believe in that. You believe in the tra- Of course we believe in that. You believe in this? Well, oh, sure we do. And they're going over everything. They've got all, oh, it seems like every base is covered. They're in agreement on everything. They said, just one more question. When you pray the Our Father, do you pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us? Or forgive us our debtors as we forgive. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And they said, well, we, we pray forgive us our debtors. They said, oh, no, no, no. We pray forgive us our trespasses. Well, you're going to have to change that over to debtors. No, you're going to have to change that to trespasses. Ain't no way we're going to do that. You either get the debtors or we're, this is a non, no deal. Well, if you can't get trespasses, no deal then. And they broke over and said, we're not going to get together. So the ones went back to their debts and the others went back to their trespasses. <laughs> Luke chapter number 11, starting at verse 1. Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples, who so he said to them, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Goes on in verse 5 to say, And he said to them, Which of you has a friend? And you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For I have a friend of mine who came to me on his journey. I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is shut. My children are in bed with me. I can't rise and give to you. I say to you, though, he will not rise and give to him because of his friend, because he's his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So I say to you, ask, it'll be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? Instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Wow. This is some good stuff. We're going to start in just part one today. We'll share more on those rest of those verses, but for today we're going to focus on prayer. Evil Knievel, you know this guy? <laughs> Evil Knievel, one of his famous quotes, I can say the Lord's Prayer in less than 10 seconds. 
<laughs> I remember watching as a kid when he was on his motorcycle trying to jump the Grand Canyon. I remember him crashing. <laughs> I remember he broke so many bones in his body, he was in the hospital for months. In fact, Evil Knievel said he's broken every bone in his body at least twice. I can say the Lord's Prayer in 10 seconds, but if you just say the Lord's Prayer in 10 seconds, is there really any meaning to it? Or are you just shooting off some words? That's a good question for us to think about because God wants it to be meaningful. And intimacy with Father comes one place. It's through the Holy Spirit. If you want to have intimacy with Father, and we say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name, we're going to get that through the Holy Spirit. How are we going to get that? In prayer. But what is prayer? You say, well, prayer is talking to God, but how can God hear when you can't see God? I mean, you don't see him, and yet you somehow believe that he actually hears you. Well, we talked about that a little bit as we were two weeks ago entering into this realm. Talking to God, you're talking to the creator of life who is in a different dimension than what you and I are in. We discussed the fifth and sixth dimension of the M theory of physics. We talked about how in the realm of physics, trying to bring together in the string theory the concept of how all of life exists. And in the string theory, it says that there are actually 11 dimensions, one dimension of time and 10 dimensions of space. Whereas you and I live in three dimensions, height, width, and depth. We have these three dimensions that we live in. Plus, we live in the fourth dimension, the dimension of time. But it has been postulated by physicists that that which is called the spiritual dimension is actually dimensions five and six of the M theory. That there is right here Dimensions 5 and 6, if you could see into them, just like if you could see in the ultraviolet realm, you would see things around you, including the angels. You would see into the spirit realm right here in the fifth and sixth dimension. But you and I don't see that dimension. And yet it's right here. Well, prayer is speaking in our three dimensions speaking to God who dwells in all dimensions, but speaking specifically into that spirit realm of the fifth and sixth dimensions. But understand this. God is beyond time and space. God is outside of those. Not just filling them all, omnipresently filling them all, but beyond them as well. And when you speak out a word in prayer, no matter how simple it is, you're speaking out from our three plus time, our four dimensions that we live in, into the realm that goes beyond time, beyond space. This concept of prayer, when we begin to pray, it's timeless. Your prayers go from where you and I live in the realm of 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. Where we realm, we live within this set time, controlled. We speak a prayer, it goes into the dimension of God who is outside of time. The one who, before time existed, created time for you and I to live in. But he is still beyond time. He sees the end just like the beginning. He sees it all. That is omniscient. He sees time altogether. That's why he also doesn't have to worry about things. He already knows the outcome. That's why you can look in the last book, 
Revelation, the last chapter. Oh, we win. <laughs> How cool. God says that's the way it's going to be. Already seen it. You begin to see God speaking this way, even in First, first Kings chapter 11, for example, and again in all the way to Second Kings chapter 18. God speaks about, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this amazing thing among you for the sake of my servant David. David was dead. Why would he do something for the sake of my servant? David's already dead. Because David had prayed. And because when your prayers enter into the realm where God dwells, your prayers go beyond to the dimension of time. Some of you prayed for something a long time ago, and you may have even forgotten that you prayed for it, and God brings the answer some season later, and it's like, I haven't even been praying for that lately. How is it that God answered my prayers now? Because your prayers entered into the realm beyond time. You have been praying and asking God to work something or to do something, and when you, in your mind, in our limited capacity, don't think or perceive or continue to expect, you put faith into that prayer when you prayed it. That faith still has power in a dimension beyond time. Not only are your prayers beyond time and continue timelessly, which I should probably mention, some of you are reaping prayers that you never prayed. Some of you are, have advantages and blessings and favor in your life. And you know why? Because you had a grandma that got down on her knees and that grandma was praying for you and you didn't even know it. That grandma, maybe who has passed away decades ago, but her prayers went before the timeless throne of God. And grandma's prayers for you are still reaping fruit in your life. Something that you should have gotten bad should have happened to you, but no, you were spared. Why? Because your great-grandma, your great-grandfather, prayed and said, when that child grows, protect him, Heavenly Father. And you are reaping timeless prayers beyond the dimension of your existence. Not only in time, but there's no barrier of space. When we think about this, the whole idea of this even praying. I don't see him here in the space I live in. How can, how can I believe that prayer is real? Let's just take a little bit of a trip, shall we? Let's go back 200 years ago. 200 years ago, before Alexander Graham Bell, before not only wireless, but wired communication, let's say we went back 200 years ago, and I pulled this out of my pocket because there was a dinging sound, and I held it up to my head, and I, oh, hey, how are you doing? Well, thank God. I'm good, thanks. Yep. And I start talking into this as if I'm talking to a human being. Some of you would be ready to certify me as insane. If I was maybe in Salem, they would call me a witch or a warlock, and they would say, oh, he should be burned at the stake. He's talking into a little box as if it's real. And yet you and I know we can talk wirelessly around the world with this thing. What they didn't understand 200 years ago about the technology of wireless is something, too, that we're just beginning to understand in the realm of the spirit, moving in the dimensions of physics, in the string theory, in the fifth and sixth dimensions. God has no barrier of space. When you talk to God, God who fills all and is everywhere in every dimension as well as outside of all dimensions. Do you see that in the scripture anywhere? Of course you do. Do you remember when Jesus, in the end of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus 
walked into the upper room where they were waiting, but the door was closed. How did he walk into the room when the door was closed? Simple. He went from the fifth or sixth dimension back into the first three dimensions. Just moving from dimensions. When angels, which sometimes take human form, come in our midst, what are the angels doing? They're walking out of the dimensions five and six into human form in dimensions one, two, and three. There is no barrier to God. And when you talk to him, when you begin to express your concern over, over that child who's hurting, over that need that's in life, God not only hears it, he shares it. There's an intimacy because you're talking with him. And there's no barrier because he's right there with you. But some people say, you know... Sometimes I'm talking to God and it feels like I'm just talking to a brick wall. What you're doing is you're expressing emotionally that you feel like there's a barrier there that you can't get through. What you need to understand though is God is on the same side of the wall as you are. Okay? He's on the same side as you are because he is everywhere, omnipresent. God is there with you. And when you begin to speak out that prayer, God, I need you. Help me with this or help my kid, help my friend. God hears it. You are breaching the barriers of time and of space and entering into the very presence of God. There's only one barrier that can come between you and God in your prayers. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I abide with iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. It doesn't mean that God can't hear you. It says he will not. Why would he not want to hear me? Because if you, for example, have an incredible bitterness. Just let's say I was really bitter against Julie, which I would have absolutely no reason for. And I was maybe mad at her for something, which I can't imagine, but pretend. If I was just, oh, I'm so mad at her. And then I'm praying, oh, God, I need you to do this. No, God's saying, oh, well, wait a minute. I'm not going to listen to that until you get your heart right with your little sister. Till you forgive her, till you are kind to her. Till you let it go. I'm not interested in this. I'm interested here and right now. You get your attitude together. You get your heart in check. You understand that? God's not saying he doesn't want to hear you. God wants you to deal with your relationship issues. God wants you to deal with the garbage of maybe the rebellion that's in our hearts. So that there's nothing to interfere. God wants no barriers. In prayer, you are talking in a very different relationship as well. This, we don't understand this too often. and It's because you and I were raised how we are a couple thousand years later after the time of Jesus' ministry. But this whole, our Father who art in heaven, Father, the Jews didn't talk about God as Father, not in this way. The name they had for God, the Old Testament name, was Yahweh, the Hebrew tetragrammon, but they wouldn't say that, the holy name of God. They would instead insert the name Adonai, because Adonai means Lord, and they were so concerned about never taking the name of the Lord God in vain that they wouldn't use his name. They would just say Adonai, Lord. But then Jesus comes on the scene, and they, he's talking about... My father. And they said, what, what do you mean your father? Well, I came from my father. Everything that I'm sharing with you is it's what I heard from, from father. He starts talking that way. And then the disciples say, would you teach us to pray the way, you know, John taught his disciples. Why don't you teach us? And Jesus said, okay. When you're going to pray, hi, father. 
connect in intimacy. Not just intimacy, but Jesus actually uses an interesting word. He uses the word Abba. Abba literally means daddy. It's, it's not like far off, frightful, oh, father, but daddy. It's closeness. It's like there's no barrier. There's nothing in the way. It's, it's just daddy. It's close and it's intimate. Now there are three times that we find this word Abba in the New Testament. You can look at them. We can share them together. And you're going to find something really important as we look at this because it is always by the power of the Holy Spirit. Always the Holy Spirit is in this. Bringing you to Abba Daddy. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to have intimacy with your Heavenly Father. Let's take a look at a few passages. For example, Mark chapter number 14. If you turn there very quickly, Mark chapter number 14. So we take a left turn from Luke. We get into the Gospel of Mark. Chapter number 14. You see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He is like in the greatest intense emotional and spiritual battle. He is so overwhelmed. He's saying, my spirit is so overwhelmed, I could die. I'm so depressed, I could die. Some of you know what it's like to feel so depressed, you could die. And in Mark chapter 14, and in verse number 36, and he said, Abba, Father, Daddy, 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 all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want. You see that intimacy. You say, well, that doesn't, that doesn't seem like it's from the Holy Spirit. It's beautiful intimacy. Well, Jesus did everything he did under the power of the Holy Spirit. And it specifically says, all of our crying out, Abba, Father, comes from the Holy Spirit. Take a look at the next verse. Take a right turn from Mark. We'll go over to the book of Romans. Mark, Luke, past the Gospel of John, past the book of Acts that we're going to spend some wonderful time in, to the book of Romans, Romans chapter number 8. In Romans chapter number 8, verse number 15, you see this incredible statement. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. This is small s. But you received the capital S, spirit of adoption. The spirit of adoption. It's important to understand the Holy Spirit is titled many different ways in the scripture. Jesus said, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit and he's going to be the comforter. He's going to comfort you. In, in the book of Revelation, it refers to the sevenfold spirit before the throne of God. Isaiah explains the sevenfold spirit. It's the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of comfort, the spirit of counsel, and explains the dynamics of the spirit of God. And here, when Paul describes the Holy Spirit, he says he's also the spirit of adoption. Why? Because he adopted you into the family of God. He made you part of God's family. He sealed you. You became a child of God because of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of adoption. And what happens? We'll continue the verse. You receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. If you didn't have the Holy Spirit, you couldn't call out Abba, Father. It's through the Holy Spirit. You get this intimacy with God. Do you see it? You can, Daddy, the Holy Spirit creates the intimacy with Father. We need the Holy Spirit for more intimacy with God. Take another scripture. The, the third time Abba appears in the New Testament. Galatians chapter number four. We take a right turn from Romans to first and second Corinthians and then the book of Galatians the General Electric Power Company. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Galatians, chapter number 4. And in chapter number 4, verse number 6, you have this statement. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son 
And you see, that's a capital S because Spirit of His Son, that is another name for the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of His Son into your hearts. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you have become the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's, he's put the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Who's crying out in intimacy to Abba, Father? The Spirit of His Son. Every time you see this deepened intimacy, you see it's connected to the Holy Spirit. Because that's what the Holy Spirit's doing. He's connecting you with Father. He's connecting you with intimacy. Now, why are Matthew and Luke different? We should answer that question before we finish up today. Really, it's a very simple thing. Matthew was written, the original Gospel of Matthew was written in Hebrew. And it was Jesus speaking Aramaic, which is a form of Hebrew. Matthew writes it in Hebrew, just like you have German and you have South German, and you have different types of German, Swiss German. When I was in Switzerland, I found it very hard to understand German unless they spoke high German. When you have the translation from Matthew, he's translating that Aramaic into standard Hebrew so most people can do it just like high German. But now you have Luke. Luke's not writing in Hebrew. Luke is Greek. And Luke is writing in a very high form of Greek. And what is he doing? He's just giving you the nuances of the Hebrew word just like we have multiple different words giving different distinction to the concept. Well, snow, for example, we have snow, sleet, hail, different descriptions of what snow can be. You have snow that drifts indoors, snow outdoors, snow that blows, snow that packs. <laughs> A lot of different words for snow. Luke is writing it in Greek. Matthew just wrote it in Hebrew. That's all. There's no difference. They're not contradictory. They're complementary. It's the Holy Spirit who engages you to talk to Abba, to talk to Daddy. And we're going to put it into your English today. What is the most intimate way you could express yourself if you're talking to somebody that's close to you? If you're talking to your father, if you have a close relationship with your father, do you call him Dad, Daddy, Papa? What is the most intimate? God wants to take intimacy and bring it into your life in a deepened way. I'm going to close off part one. We're going to share Holy Communion in just a few moments. Could I get the deacons, deaconesses, and Marty, you can just please back there. Take the elements. They're in the back of the, right there, if you could pass them out to everyone. And I invite everyone to share Holy Communion with us. In the process of sharing it with us, please, uh, we invite everyone to share. As long as you've given your heart to Jesus, we want you to share communion with us, okay? And if you haven't given your heart to Jesus yet, we'll give you a chance in just a minute to do that. All right? Um, Pat and David, um, you can reach into the, bas the, the box that is underneath right there, and you can get some additional ones to hand out to others. All right? So let's just kind of wrap up part one. I'm going to take next week and I'm going to do the next part and help you understand how God wants persistence, pushing, striving to develop that intimacy with you. What we need to understand that it's the Holy Spirit who engages us in our prayer lives. It is the Holy Spirit who puts conviction in us so we will come to God and talk to him about the things we need and the repentance that he offers for us. It's the Holy Spirit... You can't say Jesus is Lord but by the Spirit of God. You could not pray in the Spirit, obviously, without the Spirit. God wants intimacy with you. You need the Holy Spirit to develop greater intimacy with God. So the end of where we're going to be going is obviously how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? You want more intimacy with God? You need more of the Holy Spirit. You need more of the Holy Spirit? Just ask Father. 
Father wants closeness with you. Your father wants to spend time with you. Your father wants relationship with you. Your heavenly father wants to go beyond the fifth and sixth dimensions of the spirit realm and invade the four dimensions where you live. Stand with me, dear ones. We're going to pray a prayer together of surrender, acknowledging the sacrifice that Jesus has made for us before we share this Holy Communion. And I need one. Yes, please. Before we share in Holy Communion, the Apostle Paul said, you need to make sure your heart is right with God before you share communion. So let's do that. Let's make sure our hearts are ready that they're right with God. Would you just bow your head with me for a moment? Close your eyes. I want this to be an intimate moment for you and Father. And would you just join me out loud and pray? Abba, you love me so much. You sent Jesus to die for me. To die in my place for my sin. Jesus, you didn't do anything wrong, but you took all of my wrongs and died on the cross in my place. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry. And I invite you, Lord Jesus, to be the Lord of my life, to be everything in my life. I surrender myself to you. I empty myself. And I invite you, Holy Spirit, come and fill me. Make me your temple as I choose to honor you and to serve you. Melt me, mold me, fill me and use me, for I surrender myself to you. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to take off that cellophane top, and there's that piece of bread for you there. Take that piece of bread. Break it. It was at that last supper that Jesus broke the bread, and he told his disciples, this is my body which is broken for you. They were, they were the day before looking forward to what Jesus was doing. They didn't understand it. Jesus said it would be broken for them. And we look backwards and we see, wow, Jesus, he took it all for me. He was stripped naked before the multitude. He took my shame. He was beaten mercilessly. He took my punishment. He was put on that cross to take the penalty of my sin. And that upon him physically, all of sin, all of your sin and mine, was placed on that body so that we could be forgiven. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you would do that for us. You are so kind. Let's partake of the bread together. you take that foil top off you have the cup to share Jesus took the cup he passed it to his disciples he said this is a cup a cup of my blood the cup of redemption he said when you, when you take this you're receiving my life because life was in the blood and Jesus isn't just saying, I'm taking your sin. He says, I'm giving you my life. His eternal life. What a gift. Obviously, Father, we didn't deserve any of this. It wasn't about what we deserved. It's about how much you loved. Thank you for loving us. Let's partake of the cup together. As I pray a blessing over you to go today, 
including those of you who are sharing these moments with us online. I love you. God bless you. I should, I should acknowledge those dear ones that are, that are with us here. More prayer needs to come. Our Cocoa Beach campus. Hello, Bill and Sharon. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be live from Cocoa Beach in a, in a couple weeks. And greet you. Pastor Lee is going to preach, but I'm going to be live from Cocoa Beach at that campus. And others joining us, Shannon, Christine, I'm so glad you're with us. Thank you. Dawn and Sean with us. Patrick, good morning, Patrick. Good morning, Carol. Carol, I was praying for you this morning in Mexico. I was just praying over you, and I'm so glad you're with us. I wanted to be able to share this with you today. Brianne, good morning. Audrey, good morning. John and Kirsten and Rush from North Carolina, I love you, God. I know. I heard what you just said. When are you coming to the North Carolina campus? <laughs> okay. We'll work it out. Carla, God bless you. Dale, praying for you, my friend. Tom, praying for you. Thank you. All of you, others that are sharing these moments with us, my wife says hi to the family. She says good morning to all. And Jeanette, who's sharing this moment with us as well, says it's her birthday month. Happy birthday, Jeanette. We love you. We're so glad you're with us this morning. We've prayed over you, and we will continue. And Father, I pray over all of those that are sharing these moments online, our Algoma campus. Good morning, Algoma. We love you guys. Over the family that's gathered here together today, I'm praying intimacy with your Heavenly Father, that when you pray this week, you will sense a greater intimacy as you allow the Holy Spirit to really connect you with Daddy, with Abba, with the one who loves you so much. You are so loved. You are so valuable. Your life is not insignificant. Your life is of the greatest worth to your heavenly father that he would give his only son. You matter to God. May you sense it and connect with him. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you, dear ones. You are dismissed. And thank you for sharing online with us this morning, dear ones. If I didn't mention your name, I didn't have it because it wasn't listed. In, and, I, <laughs> and John, yes, I figured he did. You did. <laughs> I'm so glad. I love you guys so much and want you to, to feel that love. You are so precious. All right? And wow, so good. Thank you for all your sharing. And if I didn't mention you, it's because we didn't have a note of you on Facebook or on YouTube. But I want to make sure you are included always because you are loved. Thank you. God bless you, dear ones.